photographers or camera people or reporters are allowed to do it. You know what you are told? We can decide as a society. As many of you know, we lay out our preaching plan almost a year in advance, and if something happens, we can change along the way, but we kind of know where we're going, and this series was put together, um, God knowing the moment we'd be in time, a time when we're two years drawing near the end of a pandemic and all that's related to that, that's impacted every person gathered together online or in this room, uh, and now all that's going on in other parts of the world that impacts all of the world. And it's a time where there's lots of anxiety and lots of worry and lots of tension. And interestingly, um, studies are showing that, that teens, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15-year-olds are having more anxiety than they've had ever recorded, and that's you know, moving up into, into older ages, and there's just so much going on. And, and sometimes what, what our lives can feel like is we're just overloaded. There's too much going on. Uh, sometimes, for so some people, they feel like their life is, is like this, uh, the surge protector that's probably not protecting much of anything because there's plugs inside of plugs inside of plugs. And, and we're like, man, there's so many things we're plugged into, whether it's, it, whether it's things we watch or what we do with our free time or our work or responsibilities or what's expected of us. And we start to feel like, man, it's, I'm going I'm to short circuit if, if, I have, if I haven't already. And we can feel like, man, there's so much I'm plugged into. And the question we're going to be asking these next three weeks is how do we unplug? How do we unplug from those things that aren't necessary, that aren't important, that aren't central? And then how do we plug into the things that matter the most? And today we're thinking specifically about unplugging from anxious worry. The things that create anxiety and worry. It's like, man, I, do I need that you know, in my life? Is that really? And this, where did that come from? I don't even remember plugging that into my, who plugged that in? We're, you know, we're, we're going, man, it's, it's something, you know, something needs to change. There's these things that create anxiety and worry that we've got to say, can I, can I actually unplug from those things? And then, what do I plug in? What needs to be plugged into my life that actually leads to peace? A confidence in God's presence, God's provision, God's goodness, and peace in our hearts and our lives. And if you look with me at, at Matthew chapter 6, this is, in the, this is in the most important sermon ever preached, um, meaning the sermon that Jesus, you know, the most important sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount by the most important person who ever lived, Jesus Christ. And I ask you if you have your Bible with you or a Bible app, you can turn to Matthew 6, verse 25. The, the passage will also be on the screen here and also on your screens at home. And I want you to listen to this passage. Jesus is talking to people who knew him and believed in him and people who just were just checking out Jesus. This is for anybody who would listen. And he's giving them a perspective on some things that we need to learn to unplug from. And the primary thing is anxiety and worry. So listen with me as I read this passage and follow along if you have your own Bible. Jesus says these words to this massive crowd. He says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not your life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? That's a good question. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, and yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If this is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown in the fire... Will he not much more clothe you? You have little faith. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. I think this is the key that Jesus is building towards. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. 
Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Lord, each one of us is wired differently. There are some gathered right now online and on campus who anxiety and worry just seems to rule their hearts and their minds. They are aware of it. They, they want to stop it. It just seems to take over and consume them. Lord, there's others who don't seem to worry a lot. But wherever we are, Lord, in this world right now, may we hear your words, Lord Jesus. May we learn from you and discover how to unplug from anxious worry and discover the peace you want to offer us. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, as you look at this passage, there's all kinds of things that Jesus is saying. And I think they really connect us to this idea, to Jesus' pathway to unplugging from anxiety and worry. As a matter of fact, as I walked through this passage, I found at least 10 distinct ideas in Jesus' teaching, just in this passage, about ways to unplug from anxiety and worry. So I want to walk through the passage. I want to just see, what, what is Jesus saying to us? And here's the first thing I hear Jesus saying. He's saying, recognize that life is more than what we eat and how we look. There's more to life than what we eat and how we, even though we spend a lot of time thinking about what we're going to eat and how, what we're, how we're going to look, it's, life is bigger than that. Jesus says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? And the answer is, yes. Life is way bigger than those things. I think this is what Jesus is getting at. I, th I think he's saying, don't focus on the minor things. You say, well, our food and our clothes aren't that minor, but they're, they're very common. And if we're anxious about those things, we're going to be anxious about everything. If we're worried about the little stuff, we're going to be worried about the big stuff. So Jesus says, no, don't let those things consume you. What's Jesus' pathway to unplugging from anxiety and worry? Here's the second thing. And just so you know, many of you know this, but if you go on the Shoreline app or on our website, my entire sermon notes are all there. They're actually there before I preach my sermon. So I'm going to go through 10 ways to unplug and then another passage with 10 ways to plug into the right things. If you like to take notes, write your thoughts down. If you don't like to take notes, just listen. You can pull that up on the website later and you can kind of rethink about these things and find some of them that will help you walk in a more peaceful state as you follow Jesus. But he also says, be confident that God is good. He is a good provider. Look at verse 26. He says, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you confident that God is a good provider? Jesus says, now look around. The birds aren't worried about that. And Jesus says, and God gives them everything they need. Do you understand that God is a good provider? Do you recognize that? Do you notice it? Are, are, are you deeply grateful that you know that God provides for you? And, and do you slow down and say, God, thank you. Thank you for your provision. When's the last time you just stopped? I thought about the last day and week and month and said, God provided that. Boy, that friendship, God provided that. Boy, the place I live, it may not be all I want, but it's, it's, it's enough. God, thank you for that. Do you slow down and become aware that God is a good provider? Because Jesus, that, that's one of the keys to unplugging from anxiety is recognizing how God has been good and how he's provided. A third thing on Jesus' pathway to unplugging from anxiety is to believe that you are loved and valued by God. Jesus says, are you not much more valuable than they? What's Jesus saying? He's saying, you are precious to God. You matter to him. You're valued by him. Do you recognize that? See, when we know that God looks at us and values us and loves us, that relieves anxiety. Why? Because the one who made the universe, who rules everything, I'm precious to him. And so are you. Any of you that are parents know you do anything to help your kids. If you're grandparents, you know you do even more. I'm just kidding. Uh, but, but, there's, but if you're a parent or a grandparent, you go, of, of course, I mean, of course I would help my child or my grandchild. Of course I would. Do you know that God looks at you so, so passionately? He's so fond of you. He's going to take care of you. So, so just, Jesus says, understand, you're, he provides for the birds there. Well, you're of more value than they are. He's going to take care of you. A fourth thing that Jesus says in this passage, in this pathway from anxiety, to unplug from anxiety and worry, is to acknowledge that worry does not extend or improve your life. Worry does not extend or improve my life. 
Worrying does not extend or improve my life. Say that with me. Ready? Worrying does not extend or improve my life. It doesn't. Sometimes you think, well, if I worry about it, it'll make things better. It'll kind of help things along. Right? But what does Jesus say in verse 27? He says, can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? What's the answer? No. As a matter of fact, I'm going to say something that make, make the anxious people here feel more anxious, but it's the truth, okay? Worrying actually reduces your length of life. Oh, no, thank you, Pastor. I'm already struggling with anxiety, and now you're making me nervous about being anxious. But, but you have to recognize this. Anxiety will actually decrease your length of life, decrease your joy for life, and probably decrease the joy for life that the people around you have. And so Jesus says, who by worrying can add one single hour to their life. But we, we have this idea sometimes. If I'm anxious, if I'm worrying about something, then I'm doing something. Well, we are doing something. It's just nothing good. And there's a story I heard years ago. I don't know if it's true or not, but it's a great story. It's about a husband and a wife. The wife uh, kind of felt like she had the spiritual gift of anxiety and worry. She worried about everything. She had a gift for noticing things and worrying. Wait, wait. Like she could worry like months in advance before something was even happening. She just worried. And, and the husband kept saying to her, you know, just pray and trust in Jesus. And, and, but she's like, well, I just can't. I just, I just, I worry. It's what I do. And so one day he, he reads a study. And the study actually says, and it's, you know, people had looked at this. And it says, you know, 95% of the things that we worry about don't actually ever happen. So, he, so with this new data, he goes to his wife. To try, he says, honey, honey, I looked at the study. And here's what it says, honey. 95% of the things you worry about don't even happen. She looks at him and she says, so it works. <laughs> Some of you will get that later. Uh, and she, she's, like, she's like, oh, well, perfect. I'm worrying and it doesn't happen, so it's my worrying changing. No, it's not. Your worrying is just making you miserable and, and creating tension in life. But in her mind, she's like, you know, Worrying helps. Please hear what Jesus is saying. Worrying never helps anything. We're going to see in Philippians 4 in just a moment what does help, what we're told to replace anxiety with. But if you think that your anxiety and worry helps, it doesn't. Now, the Bible is clear that Christians should be responsible to plan ahead, to think ahead. Jesus doesn't say don't plan ahead. He doesn't say don't work ahead. He says don't worry and worry ahead. There's a difference. You can plan ahead. You can see something come. So, so, so if you're a student at the Defense Language Institute here in Monterey, and you've got three days from now, you have a really big exam, you have a language exam coming up, right? And you say, okay, I got two and a half days. I'm just going to worry and worry for two and a half days. I'm going to worry about how it's going to go. What's that going to do? Damage, actually, right? If you say, but wait, no, I'm going to study. I'm going to work. I'm going I'm to pray for the discipline to sit down and study. That will make a difference. So, so Jesus isn't saying don't plan ahead, don't work ahead. He's saying don't worry ahead because worry doesn't help anything. Jesus' pathway to unplugging from anxiety and worry. Here's a fifth thing that Jesus says in this passage. Know that God watches over you and provides for you. Just know my God watches over, for me, over me and he provides for me. We read in verse 30, if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Don't you recognize that God provides? And now we have to understand something in our cultural context. There are needs and there are wants. Most people who've been born and raised in America don't understand the difference. Every want that we can think of we think of as a need. And we, we're, oh my gosh, I, I'm not getting my new upgrade. I'm not getting the newest thing. I'm not, get, I'm not getting something I want. Well, but what do we need? I think this is why Jesus talks about you know, things like the food you eat and the clothes you our, our needs actually for life are quite simple. But we think every want is a need. And Jesus, Jesus is saying, understand that God does provide. So pay attention and notice and celebrate God's amazing provision. And then Jesus goes on. With a sixth insight, found in verses 31 and 32. And we need to recognize that Christians should respond differently. Jesus says, if you are my person, if you're following me, you shouldn't respond like everybody else to, to the, the challenge of life and the anxiety it can bring. So verse 31 says this. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans, non-believers, run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. What's Jesus saying? See, everyone 
thinks about that stuff, but you're my people. And you should have a different, here, here's your disposition. God knows what I need. And God is good, and his eye is upon me. He sees me. So I trust him. Do you live your life with trust in God? Yes, doing all that you can to be responsible, to work hard, but trusting that God's eye is upon you and he's watching over you. We shouldn't look like everyone else. And then a seventh insight from Jesus is in verse 33. And this, I think, is the hub. This is the center of the whole discussion of what Jesus is teaching. Verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Seek first above everything else his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus, make the main thing the main thing. Make seeking Jesus your primary focus. How much time in a normal week do we spend thinking about food, preparing food, planning food, enjoying food? What should I wear? How should I dress? What should I do? And all there's basic things of life. And then how much time do we spend seeking Jesus and his kingdom and walking with him and living in his presence? And if we seek first his kingdom, if we make the main thing the main thing, Jesus says, I'll take care of the food and the clothing part. Trust me. And it doesn't, and now this is not a license to say, well, I'm just going to seek Jesus every day and I'm going to do nothing else and then the food will show up and I'll get a paycheck and everything will be taken care of. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying, make him first. And when you walk with him and live in him, you'll have the strength to do the work you need to do, to, to live the way you need to live, to help provide for yourself and for others. He's not saying be lazy. He's saying seek him first above all things. And then an eighth lesson we learned from this passage. So Jesus says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And he says, and all these things will be given to you. Be confident that God will take care of the rest. Do you believe that? Do you trust in God? When you do your part to walk with him, when you do your part to live for Jesus, have you ever seen him provide for you? Have you ever seen him show up in beautiful ways? I know you have. I could put a microphone up right here and just say, listen, people come and tell stories about how God showed up and provided in an amazing way and we'd be here for a week. We all know that. So then why do we get anxious? Ah! What's going to happen? Just keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Keep your, your mind turned toward him. And then Jesus gives a really powerful insight in verse 34 about how to walk away from worry and anxiety. And that is, he says, you need to know that preemptive worry never helps. Preemptive worry. What's preemptive worry? It's worrying before something's even there to worry about. What does Jesus say in verse 34? Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. And let, give me a big amen after I read this last part. He says, each day has enough trouble of its own. Someone say amen. Hey, trust me. If, well, I don't know if I'll have any trouble to deal with tomorrow. You will. <laughs> Every day has its own trouble. But here's what Jesus is saying. Sometimes we get so wound up in anxiety, we start getting anxious about things that haven't even happened yet. What if that were to happen? And you come up with like six different scenarios, all of them bad. And then it would be, then this would happen, and then this would, oh no, my gosh, what if that happened? And then, and then we, it's like, wait, it hasn't even happened yet. We're not even, you're worrying about things that are hypothetical constructs. You're worrying about things that aren't even real and may never become real. That's what worry does. And at its core, at its core, worry is a spiritual battle. There's something demonic in it. Because the enemy knows we start to spin and spin and get twisted around the axle of our anxiety and worry, and then we get paralyzed. But when you seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and walk with Jesus, and when you respond the way the apostle Paul tells us to respond in Philippians 4, which we'll look at in just a moment, then everything can change. And instead of being possessed by anxiety and worry, peace, the peace of God begins to enter our hearts and in our lives. And then a tenth thought that Jesus shares is this. Take the challenges of life one day at a time. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I'm gonna tackle today's challenges. Not being anxious, but living for Jesus, seeking first his kingdom today. Because today is enough to work on. Today is plenty to work on. If you find yourself, your mind racing to tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, and it starts to kind of consume you, say, Lord, help me not be consumed by anxiety over things that haven't happened and maybe never will happen and probably in many cases won't happen. And, but the enemy wants you to be twisted up in anxiety instead of walking and living in peace. So in Philippians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church in the city of Philippi, gives us sort of an antidote. 
you know, Jesus shows us how to unplug and say, I don't need that in my life anymore. And, and this, isn't, this isn't important anymore. And, and to get my life more, I certainly don't need that in there anymore. And you, you get it out of there, you know. And you go, okay, but now what do I start to plug in? What are the things that will help me plug into the peace that passes all understanding? Well, that's what the Apostle Paul addresses in Philippians 4.4. 4. So listen to these words. And now let the, let the spirit of this passage speak to your heart. The Apostle Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. By the way, he's writing from prison. He writes, rejoice in the Lord always. Oh, by the way, the church was being persecuted at this time. But he says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to everyone, to all. The Lord is near. So do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all comprehension, all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, my brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Keep your mind there. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, the Apostle Paul says, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Doesn't that sound good? That's plugging in to the peace of heaven in your daily life. So how do you plug into God's peace? And how do you have confidence in his peace and his presence? Well, here's what the Apostle Paul teaches us. Number one, rejoice with relentless commitment in the Lord. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. The Apostle Paul doesn't say rejoice in horrible circumstances. Because horrible circumstances are horrible. But in a horrible circumstance, you can still rejoice in the Lord. We don't say, God, oh, this is wonderful that I'm going through this horrible thing. No. We say, God, you're still wonderful and on the throne while I'm going through this. Will you make a commitment to rejoice and who the Lord is, what he's done for you, how he's with you, always. Because that's the call. That's the pathway to peace, is staying joyful even when times are tough. And as a pastor, I've walked with people and families that are going through torturously horrible, painful seasons. And in the midst of all of that, with tears and struggle and honestly, you know, honest grief, there's also a sense that the Lord is with them, and the Lord is their peace, and the Lord is their source of joy even in the pain. That's what God offers Second, plugging into God's peace. Develop public gentleness. I love verse five. The Apostle Paul writes, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. How do you grow in peace? Here's what you do. Extravagant public gentleness. Be gentle in everything you say and in everything you do. This is a constant challenge for me. When words come to my mind, I want to say them. And I want to say them how I want to say them. It's the way God's wired me. Part of the fall, probably, too. But I mean, I'm, I'm built to, to, to say what's on my mind. My dad told me many times as I was growing up, he said, Kevin, it wasn't that what you said was wrong. He said, you just said it so badly. It's a loving dad telling his son, Kevin, you said what, what you said wasn't wrong, but just you said it so harshly, so too blunt, too direct. Let your evidence be seen by everyone. Let your gentleness be seen by everyone. Let the evidence of it be seen. So would you say to yourself, I want to work at being gentle with my spouse, with my kids, with my neighbor, with the people I work with, with my tone, with my words, with my actions. You want to bring peace to yourself and peace to people around you? Be extravagantly gentle in a way that people go, wow, she's different than she was before. Man, I can't, I thought he was going to and he was just like, hey, you know, what's going on? What? But gentleness, right? That's what, that's what the Apostle Paul says. Public gentleness, let your gentleness be evident to all. And then he goes on to say, recognize the presence of Jesus always. In that fifth verse of, of, um, of Philippians 4, let your gentleness be evident to all. Why? Because the Lord is near. Do you recognize that? Do you recognize that the Lord is near? When? When is the Lord near? Always. Always. So you can walk through your day in the presence of the living God 
and the power of the Holy Spirit hand in hand with Jesus, your Savior, walking with him because the Lord is near. You want to walk in peace? You recognize that God is with you. He's near. We have a class that we do here at Shoreline that looks at these nine different pathways of walking closely with God because we're all different. And the way I walk with Jesus is different than the way you're going to walk with Jesus. But there's these biblical models of these pathways where how do I walk with Jesus? How do I walk closely with my God in the flow of my life and know that the Lord is near? And that class, with, and we actually created a, a uh, survey tool, like a self-assessment tool to see what's my, my way of connecting with God and help you grow in that. And we actually have teams of people that meet with you one-on-one and go through your survey results and talk with you about walking more closely with God to know that the Lord is near. And we're offering that class today at 12.30, right after the service, up the, up the top of the stairs in the garden room up there. And if you're online, it'll be simulcast to you online. You just have to go on the website on the front page, where you, probably where you got on for worship today, and just click on the, it's, it's called, let's, uh, it's called the, the name of the class is Spiritual Pathways. It's called, so if you go on the website, you'll see Spiritual Pathways. Click on that if you're online. And jump into that class at 12.30 today, or if you're here on campus, stick around for one hour, and you will discover how you can walk with God more closely, more intimately, because the Lord is near. He wants to walk closely with you, and that will bring peace in this crazy world. How do we plug into God's peace with confidence? Here's a fun, practical way. Make a list of the things that are really worth being anxious about. I want to challenge every person here, when you go home, to take a sheet of paper on a computer, type these words or write these words, things I should be anxious about, and then list everything on that piece of paper, which is nothing. And then post that on your refrigerator. Post that on, on a mirror somewhere. Put it as a screensaver on your computer. Things I should be worried about. And make like one through ten and have nothing there. That'd be a good conversation starter for people at work. What's the list of you? What? There's nothing on your list. Well, because I'm not anxious about anything. Make a list. Post it somewhere. And remind yourself, these are, things that, these are the things that anxiety will help. And the answer is nothing. Anxiety doesn't help. It's a poison. It's demonic. It's not God's design for us. So make a list of all, because this is is what the Apostle Paul says in verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything. So nothing's on the list, right? But then, number five, bring it all to God. And there are lots of ways to to bring your concerns to God. So look at verse 6 again. Be anxious about nothing. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Just, just say, I, every time I feel anxious, worried, I'm thinking ahead creating these scenarios of what might go wrong. I'm going to stop and pray. And I'm going to keep praying until I stop being anxious. Every time I get anxious and worried, I'm going to start praying. Because, because the apostle says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition. And some of you are like, if I stop to pray every time I'm anxious, I can be praying all day long. Right? Not bad. And can I tell you something that may happen? If every time you're anxious, you start praying and talking to Jesus and asking for his peace and praying about the thing that's, that's creating anxiety, praying about it and laying it before the Lord, I think that it may be that the enemy who loves to watch us get twisted up in anxiety, may stop prompting you to be anxious because all you ever do when you get anxious is you start praying, and he certainly doesn't want that. Because anxiety poisons and prayer empowers. Amen? So, be anxious about nothing, but in everything with prayer and petition. Make your request known to God. And then, the next thing the Apostle Paul says is be relentlessly thankful. He says, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. Just commit yourself that every single day I will find things to be thankful for. About five or six years ago, uh, Jeff Mannion was here preaching. Now, Jeff preached last Sunday, and he was here last Sunday. If you weren't here for the service, I got to watch it online. It was a great sermon. If you weren't here, go online and watch that sermon. But about five or six years ago, Jeff was here preaching, and he talked about every day, starting your day by writing three things you're thankful for about the previous day. And I took, that, I took him up on that. I took that seriously. So I start my day in a journal. I write down Lord, thank you for yesterday and for dot, dot, dot. And I go one, two, three. And I don't stop writing until I think of three things I'm thankful for from the previous day. You know what that does for me? That starts my new day thinking about the previous day with thankfulness. That one little practice is how I've been starting my day for six years now. And I'm thankful for that simple thing because I'm just going, Lord, there, 
And, and if you think about the previous day, sometimes I have to like get up my calendar and go, what did I do yet? I don't even remember what I did yesterday. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. But in, even in the midst of challenges, there's always, I can always come up with three things I'm thankful for. Always. So just be relentlessly thankful for all that God has done and all that he is. And the Apostle Paul goes on. How do we plug into God's peace? Verse 7. Let the peace of God protect your heart and your mind. It says, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. To say, Oh Lord, let your peace guard my heart. Let my heart be filled with peace. Let your peace guard my mind. Boy, there's a battle in our minds. Or anxiety, man. This, what goes on here with anxiety for so many people is paralyzing. Lord, guard my heart. Guard my mind. Just saturate me with your peace because he wants to offer that to you as you look to him. And then, the eighth thing the Apostle Paul says is saturate your mind with the good stuff and avoid the junk. Actually ask yourself, what am I putting into my mind? Am I putting things into my mind that lead to peace and that lead to hope and that, lead, that, that encourage me? Here's what the Apostle Paul says in verse 8. Finally, my brothers and sisters, listen to this. Here's the kind of things to keep in your mind. Whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy, think about such things. What am I putting in my mind? Do you realize that your mind is so powerful? If we're feeding things into our mind that are anxiety-producing, we shouldn't be shocked that we're filled with anxiety. If we're, if we're watching, you know, if we have news on 10 hours a day and we're just getting bombarded with all this stuff, I don't know why I'm so anxious. It's like, well, I, I probably do. The next time you're going to watch a show on TV or on your computer, if you're going to watch a streaming show, just open up, open up Philippians 4, go to verse 8, say, okay, I'm gonna, before I watch the show, I'm going to ask this question. When I watch this show, is this true Noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy. Okay, let me try a different show. Uh, <laughs> you go, and you go, you know, so, so I, I, know, I, I know somebody who watches uh, police murder investigation, CSI type, bloody, gory, horrible, you know, stuff, all the time. Can you imagine somebody watching all the time? I don't know why I'm so anxious. I don't know why I'm so suspicious of people. I don't know why I have to lock my doors 19 times, you know, because, you know, it's like, it's like, well, maybe it's because all you ever watch is people getting murdered and killed. And you think that that's all that happens. And I mean, it's like, well, does the things we feed into our mind impact us? Why do parents care about what their kids put in their brains? Because it shapes how we think. It's no different when we're adults. So ask yourself, is this, is this true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy? And if it is, Pour it in. And if it's not, maybe go, maybe a little less of that. And maybe more of things that would lead me in the right direction. How do I plug into God's peace? The Apostle Paul says, follow good and godly examples. This is so, this is so good. Do you, do you have a peace mentor? Who's someone in your life that you just look at them and you go, man, even in the hard times, whew, they just have a peace about them. Learn from those people. You know, you know what the Apostle Paul says? He says, whatever you've learned or received or heard from me, seen in me, put it into practice. Paul says, if there's things in me that are good, he says, follow my example. So find someone that you can follow their example. Who is a person in your life who just seems to have the peace of Jesus? And how about this? The next time you're feeling really anxious, go to that person and say, you know, I've noticed that when you go through tough things or good things, whatever you're going through, there's always this, you just got to have this peace about you. And ask them, where does that come from? I mean, ask a godly Christian, how can you live with peace through tough times? And they will look at you and they will say, oh, I've had such deep pain and incredible sorrow and deep loss, but I walk in peace because I know who never leaves me. I know who's in me and with me. And they will tell you about how Jesus brings them peace and it will inspire you. So Paul says, what you learned from me try to imitate that, you find a peace mentor and watch them and ask them questions and learn to be more like them. That's what God gives us to each other for those sorts of things. And then finally, recognize that the God of peace and the peace of God are always with you. The Apostle Paul finishes in verse 9 by saying, whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Do you understand the God of peace is ready to be with you, to walk with you. He's with you now if you put your faith in him. 
Even if you haven't become a Christian yet, that God's watching over you and he loves you. And his arms are like this, waiting for you to come home. But he offers peace. Now, one last word before I close this in prayer. For some of you, you might say, you know what? I recognize this and I'm trying to walk in God's peace but there's a way that my brain works and there's an anxiety that just seems to consume me and I can't, even by praying and trying to do the right things, I can't seem to get there. You might need a little more of a boost. And if you do, if, if you just say, man, I, maybe I need to sit down with a Christian counselor. We have a lay counseling program here at Shoreline that's free. Anyone can get five to six sessions with a lay counselor. These are people that get, that get tons of training and only a certain number of people are actually you know, trained and put into that ministry. And those people are also trained to help you see that maybe if they can't help you, they know that this person needs a licensed therapist who's a Christian who understands how the mind works. And so we can build those bridges for you. Some of you may have physiological issues where like the chemical balance of your, the, the chemical balance of your body is out of balance and there's an anxiety that creates and you may need to help with that. You know, go to the scriptures, seek out Jesus, follow him in prayer, live your life for him. But if you say, man, I'm doing all the right things, it may be, and also for some of you, you might really need to kick off with prayer. And I would challenge you today to stick around for prayer after the service. If you're online, call the number you're gonna see in a little bit and, or, or send an, e an email with your prayer needs. And if you're on campus anywhere, come in here and let someone pray for you. But if you need someone to come alongside of you and pray, pray. if you need reference for a, a lay counselor or a professional counselor, if you need to, to figure out your chemical makeup and all that, we wanna come alongside and help you because God you know, wants to deal with all of who you are. And he wants you to learn to walk in his peace. And so Jesus, this is our prayer. Our prayer is that we would be anxious worried and wrapped up in our, in our hearts and minds and anxiety about nothing but in everything. Praying to you, petitioning you, seeking you out. We would bring things to you and place them at your feet. And you, the God of peace, would guard our hearts, would guard our minds. We'd bring your peace, your peace that passes all understanding. Locking our hearts and our minds on you, Lord Jesus. Let this become a reality as we live out your word, as we encourage each other, as we help each other along the way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I have you stand and send you off with a blessing, I want to give a couple of quick invitations. Uh, one invitation is this, that if you're going to be leaving Monterey in the next three to four months, Every quarter we do a sending time where we gather. We're going to be outdoors in the courtyard under the pergola, not the gazebo, but across from the pergola, like the kind of nice covering there. Sherry and I will be there and Pastor Roy. We want to give you a gift of this, of this sending coin. We want to pray with you. We want to give you a book that will encourage you in sharing your faith wherever God takes you. We don't want people just to disappear from shoreline. We want to send you off and bless you. So if you are leaving in the next three to four months, come by there after the service and we'd love to meet with you there. And, and if you uh, if you uh, want to learn how to walk on a pathway closer to Jesus. Like, man, I'd love to learn that the Lord is near. How do I walk with Jesus? In about uh, 15 minutes, up the stairs here in the garden room, uh, my wife Sherry will be leading a class on, on just our spiritual pathways. How do we walk with Jesus? If you're online, you can register online and join Sherry at 1230. And if you do the survey tool, you can also have a meeting one-on-one -on -one with somebody who will help you kind of put a plan together for walking more closely with Jesus. We love to help people walk more closely with Jesus. So that's available to you. If you need prayer, uh, we'll have teams up in the front here, and today's the day where maybe some of you are saying, man, I just, I'm, I'm battling this anxiety thing here. And I had a woman come up to me after the first service and just say, um, this is exactly what I needed to hear, but there were just tears running down her face. And she needed to be reminded that there's a way out of anxiety. If you want prayer for that, come forward after the service or call online or send us those needs. And if you're new at Shoreline, we're so glad you're here. Uh, we want to give you a warm personal welcome. If you're online, just uh, text the word welcome uh, to the number you see, and we will reach out to you and build a connection with you. If you're on campus, anywhere on campus, just go right here in the, in the lobby area, and there's a connection center, and they want to give you a little gift bag, and thank you for coming, and give you a warm personal welcome. If you're able to stand, if you're at home or on campus, if you're able to stand, stand with me. And receive these words of encouragement and blessing as you go from here. In the power of Jesus Christ... You do not have to live in anxiety and worry and fear. But he can fill you with peace, a peace that's beyond your comprehension and beyond your understanding. And so say no to anxiety. Get whatever help you need to get there and walk in the peace of Jesus Christ and share that peace everywhere you go. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll be back here next week for part two of Unplug. Have a great week.